everyone, welcome to my channel. My name's Amanda, and this is mostly a vlog of my late autism and ADHD diagnosis experience. <sighs> okay, I don't have my fidget yet. This is my fidget drawer that has turned into sort of a junk drawer and I really need to go through and clean it out. This is one of my favorite. Most of these are in my Amazon store. Um, this one's really fun. One of my absolute favorite ones that I don't do on video is this one. I can't use that on video because that would annoy the crap out of y'all. Um, and I love these noodles, but yeah, I've got like, yeah, let's just say I need to clean this out. One of my biggest accommodations for myself though has been using fidget toys whenever I am at the doctor's, um, at book club, talking to y'all on video. They just help my brain think, I think. I think, I think. Anyway, this video is actually um, going to be about pathological demand avoidance profile of autism. Um, okay, let me be clear in the fact that, again, I'm not a medical expert. This is my lived experience. I am autistic and ADHD. Everything that I originally read about PDA, pathological demand avoidance, um, was saying that is a profile of autism. There's a lot of people out there who are ADHD who also say that they feel they have PDA. Um, PDA is not diagnosable yet in the United States. So people who say they have PDA like myself, it's just from hearing about other people's stories. Like I'm medically diagnosed autistic and ADHD, but the PDA profile is something that I just really resonate with and, um, you know, feel that I definitely have it. Um, one of the things that I like am curious about is the people who is PDA related strictly to autism or the people who are ADHD saying they experience PDA. Um, are we going to find that PDA also can show up in ADHD people or are some of the people who are 88, I can't say that today, ADHD also undiagnosed autistic because the overlap of people who are autistic and ADHD is really high. Because before 2013, doctors could only diagnose one or the other. And there's still a lot of doctors out there who one, are still not even giving correct autism diagnosis, diagnosis is much less, um, the combo, but I mean, I still keep hearing people say that their doctors, their psychologists that they go to say, oh no, you can't have autism because you can do eye contact. Um, have they never heard of masking? That's ridiculous. Anyway, I wanted to create this video on PDA because I got a um, comment on one of my videos that I made sure to take a screenshot of because I wanted to like, remember to elaborate more on it. So I'm going to read out the comment and then in editing, I'll put it right here. <laughs> Anyone ever, um, I don't know whether or not I want to say the person's name because I didn't ask if they wanted to be in the video. So I think I'll just go ahead and pluck it out. Um, anyone ever experience issues with extracurricular activities? When I was a kid, I wanted to do so many things and I did them until it became something I had to do because we had signed up for it and paid for it. It was usually triggered pretty quickly after starting because the coach, instructor, etc., would tell me what to do and I couldn't. Then I didn't want to go back because I didn't want them to keep telling me to do something I couldn't do. Well, I could do it, but my brain said, nah, you're not going to do that. Band, softball, ballet, jazz, acting. I even did a choir thing at school and would have anxiety attacks and almost faint during practice because I was expected to sing. Now dealing with the same thing with my kids, I don't want them to end up like me where they know a little bit about a lot of things, but they didn't develop any real skill skills because they can't stick with something. But then again, not forcing them, them to do something they actually don't want to do. And I resonated with this comment so much because um, as a kid, I also, and this is really common, I think for the ADHD people, the ones who have ADHD also because we tend to have a lot of hyper fixations or like a lot of times if you are autistic only, you may have only one or two special interests, but um, 
people with ADHD tend to go into a lot more hyperfixations. But first off, I want to address the very last thing that this person said that um, I don't want them to end up like me where they know a little bit about a lot of things, but they don't develop any real skills. And I understand where that's coming from. I've had the same thing said about me. Um, I think in today's society, that isn't as important. Back in my parents and even grandparents, and you know, I'm 44, but um, just one generation before me, it was important to have one defined skill because you usually would have a career and then you would stay in that career for 30 years. Um, nowadays, people don't do that. People go from job to job. People, do, like, yes, there are some people who will stay in one career, but they still don't stay in one job. Like, there's no job loyalty anymore. And so people will, even if they're in one type of profession, t tend to go to different companies. And having a wide variety of skills is actually a benefit because when you go from one company to another, those special skills, unique skills that you have could um, be a benefit. I love the quote that's been attributed to William Shakespeare, and it's a jack of all trade is master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. And it often gets truncated with a jack of, of all trades is a master of none, meaning that if you know a lot about a little things, then you're not good at anything. But the full quote is oftentimes better than a master of one, meaning you having all these diversified skills is actually could be a big benefit to you. And I think <laughs> William Shakespeare had it right in today's modern society. Um, so that is something that I think is important to think about. But let's get back to PDA um, because that really kind of has more to do with like different hyperfixations. But the pathological demand avoidance, I... <laughs> When I was a kid, every year I wanted to sign up for softball. There was like, I did this for, I think three years in a row. I would sign up for softball. My mom would say, if you sign up to be on a team sport, you have to complete the season uh, because she didn't want me quitting on a team. And I do respect and, and understand where she was coming from on that one, but I would sign up and then remember how much I hated softball. Oh my gosh, I was absolutely terrible at it. In the three years that I participated in softball, I never hit the ball once. I hit, I bunted it one time in a practice uh, session. That is it. That is my hitting career. Now it's probably because we know that I'm autistic and have terrible, terrible proprioception, understanding where my body is in space. Um, and maybe people can overcome that. I could not. I was a terrible softball player. When the ball would come, like someone would um, throw it at me, I would like duck and cover. Um, I do not know. They, they apparently had no skill set for if you wanted to be on the team. You just had to be a warm body, I'm, I'm assuming. Anyway, every year I'd beg my mom. Every year she'd sign me up. Every year I'd want to quit. Finally, finally, I got some good sense and um, stopped going to softball. But one of the things that I did struggle with is my mom had this same kind of mentality where she would want me to join something and then become a master at it. And that um, my mask was always to be a people pleaser and to be a good little girl. So I really struggled with that. And so I would tend to stick with something for longer than I wanted because I was people pleasing or I just didn't sign up for things. I, I regret it so much now in high school. I wouldn't sign up for clubs because I knew if I signed up for something, my mom would expect me to stick with it forever, like forever. Like I got into drafting um, freshman year and I signed up for drafting 
for all four years because you could do the same elective over and over. Um, so I took a very different approach with my kids and as an adult for my own self. I try to balance it with the ADHD urge to just jump all into something and spend too much money. Um, I think it's important to be responsible with our budgets. But for instance, I was really interested in learning how to felt recently. Hold on, I gotta show you this guy. So one of my special interests has always been anything to do with fiber arts. Um, so I love sewing, crocheting, um, I tried knitting, I wasn't very good at it, but again, this isn't like me as an adult, working at like, okay, I'm interested in this, but I'm not gonna commit forever. And so I bought a couple of cheap knitting needles and some yarn to teach myself how to knit. And I learned that I didn't like it, so I went on to the next thing. <laughs> so I've been wanting to try, um, it's called felt uh, needle felting I think and you get wool and really sharp needles and you like poke it and poke and poke and poke the wool until you get a shape people who are really good at this can do amazing art with it this is my first attempt I made this cute little pug I was trying to make them square on purpose look I gave them a butt so cute. Anyway, I was trying to make them kind of cubistic on purpose, which I did. Um, I mean, he's not the best, but this is my first try. Um, but I bought like a really affordable kit to try this out and I had fun with it. So I went ahead and bought a second kit, but I haven't gone out and like bought a ton of supplies because I have a feeling this is going to be a temporary interest. He's got a little, little tail. Um, <laughs> so hold on. One thing that I have found, I had to let the real pug out the door of my office. Um, one thing that I have found to help with my PDA is to not put the pressure on myself that I have to stick with something. And like, if y'all followed me along um, on some of my videos where I've talked about the book that I'm writing, I started writing it in December and gosh, writing a book is like, it's, it takes a long time. I had no idea. I mean, I finished writing the whole book in, I forgot now, it was really short, like three months or something. Um, but the editing and all the other steps, whoo, big. And I am currently now struggling with my PDA on finishing the book. Like I am going to finish the book. I have a commitment. I will do it, but I am actively fighting against my brain where like she said, her brain just says, nope. Like um, this last two weeks, especially with um, my cat being sick, which by the way, thank you all so much for the warm wishes about my cat magic. I meant to start the video out with this, but I forgot. Um, she's doing so much better, so much better. <sighs> I was so worried about her. Um, but anyway, uh, especially with that on my mind, like I just didn't work on my book at all. But last night I sat down and, and edited it out like three chapters. It was really great. <sighs> um, but circling back, I'm sorry, this video is full of ADHD tangents. So bear with me, people. With my kids, I have made sure to not put pressure on them because I would rather them learn and enjoy a skill until they're done with it. And maybe at some point they will circle back. So for instance, my daughter decided she wanted to learn how to play the harp. And so harps can be really expensive. So that was really intimidating for me, but I, for me, it's like, I don't know, if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, I was able to network and I was able to find a very affordable harp. They can be thousands of dollars and I think we spent 200 on her harp. And um, I mean, some harps can be as much as a car. I kid you not. Now those are not the ones for a beginner, but I'm like, oh, this is an expensive hobby. But 
we found her a used harp for I think it was around 200 and started harp lessons and oh, it was so lovely to watch her play the harp I see and as a parent I wish she had stuck with it more because I want to live vicariously my kids because I have zero music ability zero zero um and everybody who's like oh you can learn anything you know what I've tried I'm just there are some things that we are not even going to be attempting a skill at because my brain and music non-starter I'll focus on other arts anyway she played I don't even remember how long I think it was a couple years but when she was done she was done and I was like okay it was sad for me but I wanted to support the fact that she knew when her brain was done and then that freed her up to try other new activities um I was a avid Girl Scout. I went all the way from kindergarten to, well, actually, I think I started in first grade because back then they didn't have very many kindergarten Girl Scout troops. But so first grade through 12th grade and I got my Girl Scout Gold Award. I like um, became a camp counselor after I graduated from high school. I was the writing director at the Girl Scout summer camp. That is a story for another day. Um, uh, that would make a really good video. Anyway, um, memory lane. Um, <laughs> and as y'all know that I have a memory disorder, whew, for me to like have the strong memories around that, I got, I had a story I need to share. Um, so I was like all into Girl Scouts. So when I, um, found that I was having twin girls, um, for, so from, some of y'all who don't know, I have, I gave birth to two assigned female at birth, identical twins. Um, now, one of them is trans male, so I get to have identical twins and one of each gender, which is really exciting. But um, at the time, <laughs> thought I was having two girls. And uh, when they were old enough, we signed them up for Girl Scouts. And I was so excited. I wanted them to be Girl Scouts so bad. And it wasn't for them. Um, they stayed in it for a couple of years because they did enjoy it a little bit, but they weren't career Girl Scouts like I was. And that's okay. Like I was sad for my own self, but I was happy that I was teaching my kids how to listen to their own wants and interests. And this does all tie into PDA because like when you have a demand on, if you have pathological demand avoidance profile, which both my kids do, and you try to force a kid who has that into activities that their brain says, nope, then it's going to cause stress and burnout and in the long run be more harmful than good. Now I do want to say one more thing is that let's say that they were feeling like demands of the staying in Girl Scouts, but they did want to like, cause sometimes PDA happens where we want to do something and our brain says no. So if that happens with your kid, they're like, I really want to stay in band or I really, really want to stay in the softball team, which, you know, if, if we had known about PDA back when I was a kid, but our brain is saying, no, if we can figure out where the demand is, what is the demand? Why is your brain, what's it rebelling against? What part of this activity is triggering the PDA? And if you can address that and accommodate it, then the you and your child or whatever who, whoever what activity you're talking about um, possibly can continue on in that activity there is ways to work around PDA but <clears throat> part of it is having the language to try to pinpoint what is the de what is the perceived demand so for instance um, I am in a book club that I absolutely love because I've never been able to join a book club before because if somebody gives me assigned reading, my brain says, no, I do not know how I got through school. Again, it was masking that got me through school. Um, but 
if I'm in like a voluntary book club and they're like, read this book, I literally cannot read it. My brain will not focus on the words. And the book club that I'm in, we just all show up and talk about the books that we're, we just happen to be reading and we share with each other. It's amazing. I love it. Um, but I've noticed that if somebody recommends a book to me, sorry, my nose is itching. Um, if someone recommends a book to me, that won't necessarily trigger my PDA because I feel like I have more choice and I'm be like, oh, thanks for the recommendation. And I don't have to read it. If somebody physically hands me a book and says, oh my gosh, I recommend this book, you should read it. And I now physically have this book in my hand, that feels like a demand and I won't read it. Um, a couple book club meetings ago, one of the members gave me a couple of graphic novels to read. And I... Um, took them because they were short little graphic novels. I'm like, surely I can do this. Nope. I can't, like, I cannot been able to bring myself to read them yet. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to, because every time I open them, my eyes just glaze over, glaze over. And it's so frustrating. But another book club member said, hey, I recommend this book to you. It was another graphic novel, because I, I had mentioned I'd never read graphic novels before, and I was kind of curious to try some. And so one book club member recommended one that I could find at the library, but the other one handed me the physical copies. The one who recommended the one at the library verbally and didn't hand me anything, I was able to read that. My brain did not, uh, the PDA did not click on. The ones who handed me the physical copies so what I'm saying is like there's workarounds. So while it seems nice if somebody hands you something to make it easier for you, it makes it actually harder for my brain. So next time that I've, I've kind of figured this out, this is kind of a pattern, a reoccurring pattern that this last instance of it just it finally solidified for me. If somebody wants me to recommend me a book and they're like, here, I have it. I can say, no, thank you. Um, I'm going to add it to my TBR re list, um, but I appreciate you handing it to me. But that's just not my preferred way of, you know, reading books or something. You know what I mean? Like, I can find something to say and then I can go and read it on my own time. Yes, then that makes it my responsibility to go find the book when they're making it easy by giving it to me but I'm not gonna read it if they give it to me. My brain just will turn off and it won't happen. So there's no point in them giving it to me. So PDA can be very frustrating, um, but I have found that if you spend time trying to figure out where the demand is coming from, and for me, it's like in, in this instance, it's the physical book, um, then maybe there's some market around. Anyway, I hope y'all found this uh, video helpful and useful um and i want to do some more let me know if y'all like it where i like pulled out this quote to like inspire me um this comment i i think that's really helpful i'm not gonna do it every time but um if y'all like having a video topic inspired by one of my comments um let me know that and i might do it more often um, and maybe not because of pda <laughs> Until the next video, guys. Bye.